Well, the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse wound up its hearings into the Jehovah's Witnesses this week. The Commission was told that despite gathering more than a thousand files on alleged and confessed perpetrators of child sexual abuse, not a single one had been passed to the police. The organisation disputes that claim, but questions remain about how it continues to handle abuse allegations. To tell us more, we're joined by former Jehovah's Witness, Paul Grundy. He grew up in the organisation before leaving in his mid-30s. Paul, thanks so much for coming on. Now, were you shocked to hear that the Jehovah's Witnesses had held those uh, over a thousand files on alleged or confessed perpetrators, as was revealed to the Royal Commission? No, it's, I was very aware that they don't report things to the police and, uh, and never have. What is it about the culture of Jehovah's Witnesses that they don't report to the police? Um, I mean, to understand that, you really need to understand the, the core doctrine of the religion. Um, ever since 1914, they've been saying that God is about to destroy everyone except for Jehovah's Witnesses at Armageddon, and then Jehovah's Witnesses alone will live forever on this planet Earth. So to justify that God is going to kill billions of people, worldly people, they have to say that worldly people are evil and worldly people are on the side of Satan. And so there's constant uh, information about how people in the world are, are bad, they're evil, they're unhappy. And so there's a general distrust amongst the witnesses of going to worldly people, of going to the police or to psychologists, etc. All right, just explain that term to us, worldly people, because it's a term you hear in the exclusive brethren as well. Yeah, so it's common amongst all high-control high religions, the uh, terms the truth and worldly people. Uh, worldly people uh, is anyone that is not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, it goes beyond people who are you know, doing things that are legal or bad, but basically every single person, no matter how nice they might appear, because they're not worshipping Jehovah, then is on Satan's side. So if those outside institutions like our legal system, like our police, are, you know, shunned, uh, if somebody is a Jehovah's Witness and they take a, a case of child sexual abuse to the police, will they be ostracised? Uh, no, they won't, and certainly the rules have eased up. So the uh, Royal Commission was looking at some cases from uh, some decades ago, uh, particularly since the year 2002, there have been a lot more um, guidelines about being more open, being more supportive of the police, and that's really coming from the legal pressure uh, to do so. And that is where it's very exciting to have the Royal Commission really highlight the, the current flaws that are still existing in the process and putting pressure on Jehovah's Witnesses so that Paul they need to change them. Uh, it seems very selective. I mean, you, you, it seems like they choose what they want to um, reject and they have to accept other things like the state education system, like uh, police if the houses are robbed and all the rest of it. How can they justify this selectivity? Uh, so that's a very good point because that is really across the board. It's the same with how Chevy's Witnesses won't have blood transfusions. They, they say the doctors are, are, are great and they'll go to doctors, but on one point they say doctors don't know what they're doing. Uh, they don't know what is the best approach. And mm -hmm. so they, um, it, it is very, it's, it's a slippery religion in, in that regard in that they can justify whatever they like. And, and that really came out with also the constant comments that they, they can't change these laws, they can't change the two witness law, they can't have women on the panels because of what the Bible says. What they really mean is what our current interpretation of what the Bible says is and that interpretation has changed constantly over you, time. You mentioned there the two witness law. Mm. Tell us what that is because that virtually prohibits um, people being able to report child sexual abuse, doesn't it? Yeah, so uh, Matthew 18, it talks about that you can't establish a, a sin without two witnesses to the fact. Uh, so what they have always said is that unless there was two witnesses to the crime against that child, it uh, was merely an accusation that could not be followed through. Now, there is almost never a person watching a child being uh, abused, and so there was never two witnesses. So because and does that still the doctrine of the Jehovah's Well, in Jehovah's 2002 witnesses. they changed that to say it can be two different accusations become two witnesses instead of two witnesses to one crime. So that you see they're starting to play with the law. There's nothing to stop them say that two witnesses includes one accusation and forensic evidence from, from the police as well. So I see uh, as long as there's enough pressure put on them that eventually uh, hopefully that will force them to keep sort of uh, making those rules so more acceptable. Is that an argument for state intervention uh, into the organisation do you think? Uh, that, that's a, a tricky sort of area, but uh, uh, st the state is already getting involved with things like uh, blood transfusions, where they take the minors off the, the parents and they enforce the blood transfusion. Right, yeah. And in fact, uh, Vin Tool, who was a lawyer in, in this case, had recommended that they are quite happy for the state to, to do that. It takes the, the legal liability yeah. away from them. All to right, Heather, so. you've got a question? Yes, but I just wanted to uh, ask Paul one thing. Do you think 
uh, that the Jehovah's Witnesses have slipped under the radar until now because there has been so much more focus on the mainstream churches? Yes, I mean, the, the numbers compared to, say, what's happening with the Catholics is fairly minor. There's only less than 70,000 in Australia, so they do uh, slip under the radar. But at the same time, it is, you know, a, a thousand cases is, is enough that they do need to get attention as well. Paul, mm. the Jehovah's Witnesses say the organisation will review its approach to child sexual abuse. Uh, is this an organisation, though, that is capable of reforming itself, given they strictly have this doctrine that they apply to themselves? Yeah, so the, the term came up, theocratic warfare or spiritual warfare, and uh, even watching the elders giving a, a, um, their testimonies, they, they are not necessarily going to be accurate uh, and completely honest. They are allowed to mislead the courts. Um, so what they are going to do and what happens really is going to come from ongoing pressure that, that financially forces them to have to do something. It will take uh, financial and legal pressure to make sure they follow through on all of these points. So if, that, if they're allowed to mislead the, the courts, how will we ever know if they're telling the truth in a legal situation when it comes to child sexual abuse? So, so with uh, the Royal Commission, uh, Stuart and McLennan had incredible and in-depth knowledge of the practices and uh, I was very impressed to see that they didn't let the elders you know, uh, try and get out of answering questions or trying to misdirect questions. So I think uh, the Royal Commission did have that, that ability to, to get to the bottom of things. There is an elder that they haven't spoken to. Is that is Jeffrey Jackson. There is discussions about whether he may be subpoenaed to appear. Can you tell us who Jeffrey Jackson is and why he would be a key witness to appear before before the Royal Commission. So uh, Jeffrey Jackson is one of the governing body and I know him personally. He, his family brought my family into the, the truth as it's called. Um, he's now based in New York and one of the seven leaders. So the governing body are told, uh, the, the followers are told they must follow the governing body as if following God himself. So he's the, one of the ones that will make that final uh, decision on, on these changes. Uh, but for him to appear, I find it very unlikely that he would do so. It, uh, it really would be pulling back the veil. I think that um, if he has to really go through what the processes are, and that although they, the governing body claim that God's Holy Spirit directs them, the actual internal process is that they have a majority vote on changes. Now that is why, as the governing body members change, then the doctrines have changed as well. And I think to, to sort of get in front of the courts uh, would, would not be very uh, uh, productive for the There religion. are reports that he is in Australia at the moment. If he was a, subpoenaed to appear, what do you think he should be asked? Uh, so he's, um, I think just to really outline the, why they, the reasons that, that they have these particular policies and why they can't change, you know, what is stopping them having women on the judicial committees uh, there's definitely precedence for, for women being involved in, in the Bible. And so to have women involved, to change the true witness rule, to not be so restrictive, etc. You know, what are the real reasons that are, that's preventing them changing that? And what would be the process to allow those changes? Paul, it's a very hard organisation to leave, isn't it? It took you virtually 10 years to leave. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, so when, because you're brought up and believing that all worldly people are evil uh, and you're really um, not supposed to have worldly friends, your entire social circle are Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, your family generally all Jehovah's Witnesses. So if you leave, then you have, uh, uh, well in my case I've got this fellowship which means my family are not allowed to speak to me virtually ever. Uh, so like on, on that day I lost all my friends, all my family. Um, even if you become inactive, so Terry O'Brien said that you know there's nothing to stop a person drifting out. But even then, you, if you're not active, then the other Jehovah's Witnesses are not going to socialise with you. You will be considered bad association. So it's a, a very difficult precipice to come to to go. I have to basically lose everything and start life. Again. And just briefly, what triggered your your idea that the outside world was not full of evil? Oh, I, t I went when I left. I still wasn't sure. I was terrified. Um, uh, but I had to take the plunge. I just knew um, I couldn't, couldn't believe in what the religion was teaching. And I, luckily I had a job and I slowly started building up friendships uh, before taking that step, which is an important part of leaving. Well, Paul, thanks so much for speaking out tonight and uh, giving us a fascinating insight into the world of Jehovah's Witnesses. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. And that is all for The Drum tonight. Thanks very much to our panellists, Adam Crichton, Bruce Haig and Heather Ewart. Our website is at abc.net.au slash the drum. See you again.